morning. Uh, we start to discuss uh, this topic two, ideas and theories that influence early childhood education. So we would be starting on the ideas and theories that influence ECE. The learning outcomes are explain the importance of the past on the idea of early childhood education, discuss ideas and theories of great educators who have influenced the field of early childhood education. And to summarize, we will be talking about the programs of early childhood education which are used today are based on the ideas and philosophies of the past. Early childhood education is widely recognized today and the importance of play in child's development and learning process is firmly acknowledged. The attitude towards children, their roles in the family and their needs have changed over the years. How children are taught and how society responds to their needs is dependent on how they are seen and viewed. And some of the key terms that you will come across are a blank slate, environmental education, father of kindergarten, growing plants, infant schools, sensitive periods, and sensory education. The past ideas, practices, philosophies, and principles. So those are the base for today's context. Applications used in the past help today's early childhood educators to implement teaching strategies. The history, development, and theories of early childhood education have great influence on the present curriculum teaching strategies and methods, according to Brewer, 1992. So here it says uh, the Malaysian context. For the Muslim community, Islamic influence in early childhood education also needs to be given emphasis and priority in the curriculum and the teaching strategies. This is according to the Islamic Foundation of Education and Welfare in 1997. So in the same way in Sri Lanka, we too have our uh, influences to consider about. So these are the great educators of the past who have had an influence on our present early childhood education curriculum and systems. So we talk of Martin Luther, John Amos Comenius, John Locke, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Johann Heinrich Petzelosi, Robert Owen, Friedrich Wilhelm Frobel, Maria Montessori, John Dewey, and so forth. So we talk of, uh, just discuss a little bit of all these important people. Martin Luther from 1483 to 1546. What was he? He was a famous religious reformist. And he said education should be universal and compulsory. And he was the first humanist educator and he advocated basic education for children, girls especially, and the poor. Encourages parents to educate by teaching morals and catechism, that is religion. And he said family was the most important institution of childhood education. And his primary goal was to teach socialization, religion, and morals. And we have John Amos Comenius. What did he say? So it is more than 100 years after Luther proposed certain reforms in education. And he said education should be a positive learning experience and schools should be a happy place of freedom and of joy. And he adhered to 
in the Pontsuri concept which matches Piaget's time-sensitive stages of development to methods and practices of childhood education. And we will be talking of Piaget, the uh, most important uh, theorist when we talk about uh, education. Later on, we'll be talking about Piaget. And these are the stages common yes recommended and which has something similar or more than something that is similar and falls in line with today's education patterns. He says mother school before age of six years, vernacular schools from the age of six to 12 years, Latin school from age 12 to 18 years and university from the age of 18 to 24 years. So it's almost the same as the age uh, gaps or the age breakdowns of today's education, although in different names. And he wrote a book and it was where a picture dictionary called the Obras Pictures to help children. And it was a guideline for teachers that included training of the senses and the study of nature. So it was uh, early education, very important, talking of the training of the senses, of the five senses, and also the study of nature. And he encouraged curriculum interaction. He said learning should be active and interactive. Children should learn how to write by writing and talk by talking. So that is practical experience. And he said the progression of good learning should be from general to specific, from easy to difficult. And learning by doing enhanced the sensory skills. And he encouraged play among children of the same age. And he said each and every one of the senses should be involved in the process of learning for maximal, maximum effort. For example, both showing an object and explaining what it is. So just not only seeing it, but also talking about it. And learning activities are crucial. And hence a school is a child's workshop where he can work with complete attention and rapt interest. So he uh, said that school should be a place of interest. Then later on, when we talk of Montessori and Piaget and the other contemporaries, all of them adapted and refined these principles. So they worked on these early principles. And adding in the manipulation of concrete objects, project approaches and activities. So these came in, these were not uh, there earlier, but uh, later on Piaget and Montessori added these manipulation of concrete objects and active learning. Then we talk of John Locke. He was an English philosopher and he was recognized as the founder of modern educational philosophy. He coined the well-known concept of tabula rasa. So that is an important concept of tabula rasa or you call it a blank slate. A blank slate which means that a child does not have anything in his mind, it is a very pure. And he says, experiences provided by parents, society and education would paint on it. So a completely blank slate where the environment plays a major role in changing the ideas of a child. So his uh, theory was of environmentalism. What did he opine? That it is the environment and not innate characteristics that determines who a child becomes. So he said it is not the innate capabilities, that means the inbuilt capabilities of a child, but it is the environment that shapes his uh, characteristics. And he says great influence on modern early childhood education and practices. So now the modern practices are based on his views. He said children should be given opportunities to experience and acquire knowledge through their senses and experiences. 
and assumed that there were no innate ideas in the process of human learning. So innate means something that is inbuilt. He said there is nothing inbuilt, but everything is shaped by the environment. He formed, he formed the basis of his theory that a mind is a blank tablet, uh, that means a blank paper or a white paper. So that was his theory. So according to Morrison, it says, let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, a white paper, void of all characters, without ideas. How come it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word from experience. In that all our knowledge is founded and from it that it ultimately derives itself. So everything is formed through experience and nothing is there inside you but it's the environment and the experiences that shapes the character. So using this idea, Morrison expounded that the primary role of influencing environmental factors is evident in programs in which early education is encouraged and promoted. And as a way to overcome or compensate for a poor or disadvantaged environment. So he said, if uh, a child comes from a disadvantaged environment or a poor environment where no cognitive feedback has been given, it is up to the early education, early child education centers have to promote and encourage them. So that environment will help the child to overcome the lack of all what he got from his earlier environment. So early schooling programs for three and four year children are based on the premise that some children are not ready for experiences in the kindergarten and first grade and such are the risk for failures in school. So that means the children from uh, say disorganized or disadvantaged backgrounds when they enter school they are marginalized because they do not have the proper cognitive abilities because they did not get it from their home environment. So the early schooling programs are meant to bridge that gap. Public funding to facilitate early schooling for those who are considered disadvantaged is very common today and such programs are specially designed. So the, there are special programs to help these students who are marginalized, who don't have the proper background to come up and to uh, kind of uh, get in power with the other students. So as Locke believed that experiences determine the nature of the individual. So he said it is experiences that determine the nature of the individual. And sensory training becomes a prominent feature in the application of this theory. So sensory application, sensory uh, features, those are very important here. And it had a strong influence on others, especially on Maria Montessori, who formulated her system of early education based on sensory perceptions. So the five senses have to be stimulated according to Locke and that is what Maria Montessori also greatly believed in later on. Now we talk of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, another very important person in education. He wrote this famous book called Emile and it talked about an hypothetical child from birth to adolescence and tracking his progress and development. So it was, he had an imaginary child called Emil. He wrote about this child and what he said was, God made all things good, man meddles with them and they become evil. So that reflected both Rousseau's educational and political views. So God makes 
everybody good but it's the environment that finally shapes and makes a man evil. So what did he promote? He promoted the idea of naturalism and he advocated that children should revert back to nature. His idea of naturalism referred to abandoning society's artifice. So he said the society should not be influencing children, they should be back with nature. And he encourages the qualities and characteristics of children such as happiness, spontaneity, inquisitiveness and pretense, stating that natural education allows for growth without undue interference and restrictions. So he wanted the children to be happy and free and with nature without any influences from the society. And this learning method encourages parents and teachers to allow children to develop according to their individual natural abilities and not interfere with development by forcing education upon this. So this was Rousseau's idea. And he also said children should not be overprotected from the influences of society around them. So that means they should not be mollycoddled. Uh, they should be allowed to face the dangers of society and come to terms with it. And he said environmental of the environment of the school should be flexible in meeting the needs of the children with res less restraints and include concepts of autonomy and self-regulation. So what he meant was there should not be any rules. So self-autonomy should be given to the students and no restraints. That was his philosophy. He wrote, all that we lack at birth and need when we grow up is given to us by education. This education come to us, comes to see us from nature. So he was talking about this education from nature. From men or from things, the internal development of our faculties and organs is the education of nature. He says, it is not enough merely to keep children alive. They should learn to bear the blows of fortune, to meet either wealth or poverty, to live, if need be, in the frosts of Iceland or on the sweltering locks of Malta. So, according, uh, this is uh, what Morrison writes about what Rousseau, about Rousseau. He said that they should be able to face anything, maybe even uh, the very cold climates in uh, Iceland or the sweltering hot rocks of Malta. So, that means what he meant was they should be able to face any trials in life. His ideas and beliefs about childhood education. What did he say? He said the true goals of education should not be primary a vocational one. He said children only really learn from first hand information. Children's view of the external world is quite different from the adults. And based on this belief in the inherent goodness of children and their ability to choose what they need to learn, free play is an important part of childhood education. So he believed in the inherent goodness of the children. He said children are good. It is a society that makes them evil. And uh, he said the children should have the ability to choose what they need to learn. And he said free play is an important part of childhood education. The use of concrete rather than abstract material should be used in teaching young children. So they should be able to really see and grasp things and ideas and not only abstract ideas. Uh, the various stages of education should coincide with the distinct phases of development of a child's mind. So, education should coincide with the development of cognitive ability of the child's mind. And teachers should be encouraged to be aware of the stages of development of a child and coordinate and tailor instructions and lessons accordingly. So, what he says is the syllabuses should not be made first, but more or less uh, the teacher should observe the students and their individual uh, capabilities and develop 
the instructions, tailor the instructions. So they should be tailor made to uh, the students' capabilities. Then we have Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. We'll see what he has to say. So he was influenced, greatly influenced by Rousseau. And Pestalozzi also held strong conviction that education should go abide with the nature of the child. So education should be according to the nature and the capabilities of the child. Then he raised his own child based on Jean, uh, Jacques uh, Rousseau's idea using the book Emile as a guide. So his own child, he tried to bring him up according to what uh, was said in this book Emile. Using methods that harmonized with nature and nature and the educational practices. What else did he believe? He believed that education meant the development of the senses, just like the earlier one. And part of Pestalozzi's curriculum was based on study of nature and emphasized the importance of play and sensory experiences and included principles of on how to teach basic skills and the idea of caring as well as educating the child. So just as the modern principles of uh, early childhood education says, the caring is as important as the education. Love, respect, patience, understanding were very crucial elements to be included while teaching children. So these are the modern uh, aspects as well. So the modern considerations also include love, respect, patience and understanding. And he strongly believed that the senses could be sharpened or cultivated by practicing. So these are the, there are three main assumptions of uh, Pestalozzi's theory. First one, his development theory was grounded in his fundamental belief in a child's innate goodness. He said the child is good at first, which he illustrated using the metaphor of a developing plant. So he said a child is like a plant growing up uh, like from nature. Second, he said that education could only properly happen in an environment in which a child felt and experienced love and care. So he uh, equalized a child, a young child to a young growing plant and also he said it, the child should only study or he would be able to be educated only if there is uh, love and care. And thirdly, he felt that education was meant to stimulate the child's potential through experiences that could meaningfully enhance his or her innate intellectual, moral and physical capacities. So. Education was meant to stimulate whatever the child had in him as an intellectual, moral and physical capacities could be enhanced by education. He also shared and expounded on his ideas in education in a book called How Gertrude Teaches Her Children. So that was a book that uh, Petzalozzi wrote. And what he had was, he said, method of moving from easy to more difficult. He emphasized the importance of an integrated curriculum that would holistically develop the child. So from easy to difficult and a holistic integrated curriculum. And he said to be holistic, the head, hand and the heart should be educated. So that means the cognitive ability, then his cognitive abilities and the psychomotor abilities, all those should be educated at once. That means the head, the hand and the heart. And his theories on education and caring have stood the test of time. Still, those are the ones that have been practiced. The basis of many common teaching practices of early childhood education right till today. So even till today these uh, theories are being practiced. Then we have Robert Owen and he was an entrepreneur who managed a model mill town called 
New Land Ka in Scotland. So he was a educationist, but he was also entrepreneur. So he had an experience in industry, and his influence on education was great. His education philosophy was also based on environmental, and it was called environmentalism. He felt that the environment in which children are raised predominantly influences their beliefs, behavior, and achievements, just like the earlier ones. And he upheld the idea that society and persons acting in the best interest of society had the power to shape the individual characters of the children. So what he said was society, the people of standing in the society could uh, and who had the best interest of the society at heart could play a big role in educating children because he was an entrepreneur himself. So in 1816, he opened a school for infants in New Lanark. So he was a businessman, but he opened this school for infants. Uh, he intended as a, it was a care center for about 100 children aged between 18 months to 10 years. Uh, and they were the children of the workers who were working in his cotton mills. So the earliest concept of a crash is, was like he wanted to, the children of his workers to be looked after like the modern daycare centers. And a similar school was opened in London in 1818. And partly motivated by Owen's intentions to differentiate the children from their parents who were largely uneducated. So he had an idea. He said the children, the people who were working in his mills were uneducated, but he did not want that to be of the children. He wanted to create a difference and he wanted to educate the children. He also set up a night school for the workers to educate and transform them into rational beings. So these uneducated workers also he wanted to educate them and he had a night school for them. And young children went to his nursery and infant schools. That those were the young children and for the older children who worked in the factory because those days even uh, children without going to school they were working. So what he said was the older children who were going to work uh, had to attend his secondary schools uh, after work and he called them institution for the formation of character. So he felt that uh, there should be a difference from the literate people, the parents and he had an infant school as well as a secondary school. And his school in a dance, song and outdoor play and it also had reading, writing, arithmetic, sewing, geography, natural history, modern and ancient history and his was, he said it was a legacy on the infant schools in England and those are what developed into what we call the kindergartens today. Then we have Frederick Wilhelm Frobel what did he do? And he also created in kindergarten a place where he envisioned children learning through play. His close relationship with Pestalozzi, so he was influenced by Pestalozzi and his readings on Rousseau and he came to the decision to open a school to implement his ideas and he earned the title of father of kindergarten. And his uh, primary contributions to educational thought and practices are in the areas of learning curriculum, methodology and teacher training. So these are very much connected to the, today's uh, learning theories. He was the first educator to develop a planned systematic program for educating young children. So planned and systematic curriculum and plan was initiated first by him and based on his concept of children and how they learn on the idea of unfolding. So the same idea which was advocated by Comminus and Pestalozzi before him. So unfolding like a plant. What is there? It gradually unfolds and grows. Places the educator, parent or teacher in an observatory position. So he says 
watching natural unfolding of the child's mind by providing opportunities and activities that will lead the children towards learning when they are ready. So the parents and the teachers should not be interfering according to him. They should be observers and give the uh, impetus when the children are ready at their different stages. So what he said was the teacher's role was to be an assistant and a guide and towards the children to develop their own inherent qualities and readiness for learning. So when they are ready for learning, the parents and the teachers should give them the encouragement and support. So the teacher becomes the designer of experiences and activities. So the teacher is teacher designs it and he gives it to the students when they are ready. He left a significant mark and influence through his formula for the kindergarten system. And he stressed on the importance of play and the use of gifts. So the play material were gifts and the occupations were the activities. So just like in a, a modern uh, early childhood center. So kindergarten paraphernalia comprised of things which attracted children such as pets, blocks, sand, finger plays. So all these things which he knew would be attract children were the materials that he used. His observance of children led to his understanding on how they learn and what they are attracted to and like to do. So he was observing. After his observations, he knew that these are the things that these children would be interested in. Right. So his main theories and ideas, both the outdoors and indoors are good learning environment for children. Outdoor activities should be encouraged and uh, an interest in natural sciences. Children should be allowed to move around freely. Symbolic and imaginative play are important elements and show high level of learning and cognitive development. So free, uh, freedom to just to move around freely and to work uh, or to play in the environment with the natural settings. And he said it will show an important and high level of learning and cognitive development. And also talked of relationships, positive feelings, being a part of the community were important to the development of a child. And then we come to Maria Montessori. She followed in the footsteps of Robel and she was equally passionate very passionate about children and their education. So her system of educating children was had a great influence, which is still uh, there in every program for early childhood education. He was, she was first a physician, a female, the first female physician in Italy, and she worked in the slums of Rome with children who were poor and were disabled and mentally retarded. So this experience made her interested in looking for educational solutions for children who were deaf, paralyzed and they, those who were termed as idiots in those days. And he, she believed that mentally impaired children could be trained and taught to become more competent and able to live fuller lives instead of just being safe. So those days if a child was disabled, she was being kept safe hidden in the house and not allowed to come into the society. But what she thought was that these children should be made a part of society, not just being kept safe. Then uh, she collected all the thoughts from the earlier educationist to find a key to unlock and develop the right educational program for handicapped children. And she established a preschool called Casa di Bambini or a children's house and her first school had 50 children uh, between 2 and 5 years and uh, she got the backing from the Roman director general in the Roman Association of Good Building to organize schools for young children of families in the tenement houses in that area. So she started with 
uh, employee. She had only one employee and she was a young woman who was not trained at all. But uh, with the, the uh, impetus and the training and the love and care that Maria Montessori had, they managed to do this school. So both a concept and a philosophy of child development and a plan for guiding growth. Montessori's method is founded in the belief that education begins at birth and the early years are of the utmost importance. So she says from birth education is happening and the early years are very important. The most important the crucial areas of, the, of life is from birth to six years. And it is a, pe a period where a person's intelligence, his greatest asset is formed and developed. So these founding principles which should be the ultimate basis of early childhood education is to assist the natural development of the child. And she talked of a mental development with several sensitive periods. So this is important. She talked of sensitive periods. And uh, what she says was well, the children go through these sensitive periods at different uh, times. And when they are ready for it, at that time they are curious and they are ready to acquire knowledge, to acquire certain sets and skills. And later on, Again, they come to another period of uh, interest, curiosity level, and then they develop further. So there are different sensitive, many sensitive periods within this time of from birth to seven years. So the sensitive periods allow the child to relate to the external world, world with intensity. So during that small window of time, the children are very inquisitive and they are very intense. So that is the time that they are keen to gain experience and learning. So it is during this period that everything appears to be easy and everything is seen vivaciously and with enthusiasm. So during that open window of that time, the children are very curious and very interested and they are very enthusiastic and every effort marks increase in power. So every effort that they take makes them more powerful and more confident. Then we have John Dewey. He was an American and he was a philosopher, social reformer, educator and he also brought a fundamental change to approaches in teaching and learning played a central role in progressive movement in schooling which maintained that students must have vested interest in what they were learning. So what he said was he was an uh, American and he was into business and he said that if the children or students are learning they should have a special interest only what they are interested in they will learn. So his philosophy placed great emphasis on the needs of meaningful activity in learning and participation in a democratic classroom. So there he said uh, the children should be free, democracy should be there and uh, they were to be, there should be a lot of physical activities, intellectual pursuits and utilization of things and social interaction. So he said uh, learning is active and schooling is often unnecessary, long and restrictive. He said the school to be restricted for eight hours or whatever in a school is not necessary. He says it's long, unnecessarily long and restrictive. He opened the school as a place where children came to do things and experience and interact in a community and where they had real guided experiences that cultivated and developed their capacity and ability to contribute to society. So his idea was the students should come to learn something to be able to contribute to society and they should not be restricted in a classroom. Then the growing and developing child had to use tools and materials to do, ha do hands-on activities. So more skilled based. So he encouraged skilled based education where the students were interested in some kind of a vocation. So he encouraged living activities or occupations like cooking and carpentry. And then there we had uh, talking about others, Rudolf Steiner, 
uh, he talked of the world of school of education and then margaret macmillan championed education issues of poverty in young children importance of fresh air bathing and sleeping so health was the handmaid of education so she was very keen on health issues in uh, education so her school in the school the students were fed they were cared for and uh, she was talking about health fresh air and bathing and sleeping so like even in our uh, childhood early childhood centers we have all that now then we have susan isaacs so um, she contributed to nurseries and progressive schools in the 20th century and what she said was the role of the teacher was a force of love and as the good but regulating parent who allows the opportunity to express aggression but in a modified form so here she says uh, like a parent now parent is free to use a force on a child if the child is misbehaving or whatever so she said a school teacher should have that uh, kind of leeway where they should be allowed to do give a little aggression or a punishment if the child is not comply so the teacher should not bow down to negative sentiments or hatred and oppression so it is not through hatred or oppression but like a loving parent the teacher should have the right to admonish a child if there is something wrong happening and also the importance of hearing and acknowledging a child's point of view to listen to a child and uh, supported the notion of play being a child's work so she said the work of a child is play so give prominence to play right so what is the activity so think about an early childhood education provision in your area can you identify the provisions any of these influences from the great early child education philosophers so in uh, the early childhood centers in your school in your areas do you see any of the philosophies that were discussed and which were advocated by these early childhood uh, early uh, philosophers just think out of what you are doing if you are teaching or if you are familiar with an early childhood center just see what are the philosophies that are being practiced in those school, uh, centers and the self check is look at the list now what we mentioned all the ece thinkers early childhood educators and philosophers dis discuss the contributions like we discuss now cite at least one example of how each viewpoint can be applied in the classroom for early childhood education today so take uh, some of the characteristics that we discussed and see whether these could be applied to the early childhood education today so the summary which i said earlier uh, the programs of early childhood education which are used today are based on the ideas and philosophies of the past early childhood education is widely recognized today and the importance of play in a child's development and learning process is firmly acknowledged so play is very important attitudes towards children their role in the family and their needs have changed over the years and how children are taught and how society responds to their needs is dependent on how they are seen and viewed so these are the key terms that were discussed blank state environmental education father of kindergarten growing plants infant school sensitive periods sensory education these were the key terms that were mentioned thank you that's the end of topic